In recognition of Breast Cancer Awareness Month, our guest this evening is Dr. Dorothy Teagarden. Dorothy is the director of the Women's Global Health Institute at Purdue. She's also the professor in Purdue's Department of Nutrition Science, and she is the associate director of education and training for the Purdue Institute for Cancer Research. She will discuss how the Institute impacts women's health research at Purdue and beyond, and secondly, address cancer prevention. With that, Dorothy, I'll let you take it away. Thank you. Great. So um, it's really a pleasure to be here and talk with you all about the Women's Global Health Institute or the WGHI. And I work with this fabulous team. Um, I'm really privileged to work with Ulrike Dudek, who is our Associate Director, and Luann Vermel, who is our Managing Director. So at the Women's Global Health Institute, our mission, and I'm gonna read this um, uh, because I think it's really important, is to um, raise awareness and support funding to develop and implement innovative interventions and technologies to prevent disease and improve the quality of life of women um, globally uh, based on creative interdisciplinary, and we address this very broadly, interdisciplinary research and education. And so for our research focus, we uh, take all comers. We'll, we'll support any research that helps women's health. Um, however, we have a focus on disease prevention and early detection. And what we do really well is we have, uh, raise awareness of the issues in women's health, but we're also really good at creating partnerships to bring different people into the field of women's health research, um, including investigators who may not have even thought about it before, but to try to bring more people into the area. Um, and again, to promote innovative interdisciplinary research. Um, so um, we actually don't receive any funding from Purdue directly. Um, so we are completely dependent on our, our individual donors who we greatly appreciate, but also our partners. And I wanted to give you a spectrum of some of our partners that we have engaged in women's health research. Um, so we work with, a, a, have worked with many of the institutes and centers on campus, including, and I'd like to call out the Purdue Institute of Inflammation, Immunology and Infectious Disease for their really generous support of our managing director. We've also leveraged partnerships with many of the colleges and departments on campus, um, and particularly the health, the College of Health and Human Sciences has really helped us quite a lot. Um, we uh, engage with other Purdue entities like the Women in Science Program, the Division of Diversity and Inclusion. So many different uh, places on campus have supported our work on women's health. We've gone beyond Purdue. We have uh, support, had gotten support from IU, but particularly the Catherine Peachy uh, Fund, we have a wonderful partnership with them. And of course, our individual do donors who were really appreciative of all of their support. Um, so the Institute has a number of different programs, activities that we do regularly. Uh, one of our most important functions is actually to support, provide funding for uh, research in women's health. And we have two calls every year. One is a women's health research grants. And for that one, we'll support any research that we think is really good research focused on women's health. And it's all at Purdue. And our second call is with our partner, the Catherine Peachy Fund, um, uh, it, which is based in Indianapolis. Uh, and we fund grants focused on breast cancer research for that call. Um, we have a really good uh, rate on return. We're really happy about this. Um, uh, so that each of the, the faculty, if you average the amount of external funds that our funded researchers have gotten, it's $42 of external funding for every dollar we're invest, we've are we invested. So we're really pleased with our researchers. Um, so um, I wanted to show you some of our grants that we funded because they're pretty exciting to me. Um, here are a couple of them. For example, we've helped Jackie Linus, and she has created a point of care device for cervical cancer detection. It's really inexpensive. It's like a piece of paper that she can carry out in the field anywhere in the world. Uh, Craig Gorgian has a um, cool device that he's developing to predict and prevent preeclampsia during pregnancy. So it's wearable, take it home. Um, we also funded Yoon Yao. Um, to develop a nano-based drug delivery for more effective ovarian cancer chemotherapy. 
Um, so uh, those are, I wanted to show a couple more that are some of our more recent funded ones that we're really excited about. We These were funded in the last year or so. So we funded research on Alzheimer's disease, as well as this one's a really cool pesticide neurotoxicity. What's the impact of pe uh, pesticides on neurotoxicity in farmers? Uh, so they're looking at husband and wife partners to compare in the same place uh, the differences between men and women responses. And what we're particularly excited about with these last two projects, as these are brand new research teams. So they came together in order to do this project for that we funded for them. And we're pretty excited. They have very unique expertise to come together. One of the peachy grants that we funded um, was to advance uh, early breast cancer evaluation using MRI. So early detection of breast cancer. And we also funded this program um, that is based in India. And uh, this is uh, related to a group of women, a self-employed self women in India, who work on providing medical care through a community-based system. And these researchers are going to, uh, are now, uh, evaluating the effectiveness of that system. And then they will give those results to the Indian government with the hope that they will, showing the success of the program will more broadly apply um, this community-based program to improve the health of India. So we're pretty excited about that program too. Um, so um, that's one of our events uh, or our goals. Um, another one is we have an annual symposium um, on campus. Uh, most of them are hybrid these days. We learned something. Uh, we have high profile featured speakers who come in and we highlight our own Purdue researchers so that we they we they, we can sell their research across campus. We host a poster session, which is a great way where people interact, exchange ideas, exchange technologies. And we also have a poster uh, competition for our graduate stu students um, to encourage them to also interact and present. Uh, this year, we um, brought in Dr. Christiana Kuhl from Germany, and she's a world-renowned person in the field or researcher, and um, she also practices in the field of early breast cancer detection, um, diagnostics, imaging. Uh, it was a really, she was a fabulous speaker and we're, um, was really well attended and well received. We also hosted uh, Janine Clayton, um, in a joint symposium with the um, Clinical Translational Science Institute. And Janine is the director of the NIH Office of Research on Women's Health, the National Institute of Health. And she's really um, the founder of much many of the policies that are currently in place at National Institute of Health that require women to be included in research. This was a major advance in the area of women's research. So we were really pleased with both of these. So, um, this event, I think, has really helped to, uh, it's a great networking opportunity. Um, and I think it's really helped us to build a pretty strong community in women's health research on campus. But because it's also virtual, so we send it out, our presentations out um, uh, to all of those on our mailing list, They um, it has also highlighted Purdue as a place that has a focus on women's health research. So really has brought to light uh, Purdue as a place to be. Our last regular event is this interview series. I love this one, um, in which um, uh, we, we call it Leading the Way. Um, and in this case, uh, we bring in renowned scientists and leaders uh, in the area of women's health research. And someone at Purdue will interview them about their contributions to women's health research. Also, we kind of tie it in with women in science experiences and career paths and insights on work-life balance. How did they handle personal and work life as they progress through their career? We've had some really um, funny anecdotes and a lot of insights into that. Um, our first speaker was Rita Caldwell, who was the first female director of the National Science Foundation. And um, she was a really interesting person um, and researcher. So she uh, also got her master's degree at Purdue in the mid 1950s. 
So it's kind of interesting to hear about women in the middle of the 1950s trying to get a master's degree. Uh, it, they had it a, kind of tough then. Um, but uh, one of my favorite questions on all of these interviews uh, came in Rita's when she, um, uh, I don't actually remember the question, but it was from a, an undergraduate student at a small liberal arts college who was studying Rita's work in her biology class that week and at, was able to call in and ask a question. And, you know, I think about Rita and um, all she's done for, for women in science, and she's still inspiring uh, young women scientists for, again, even the next generation. So it was really cool. I really enjoyed that one. We're really excited about our upcoming interview with Dr. Paula Johnson, who is the current president of Wellesley College. Um, and she will be on November 16th. Um, she will be interviewed by uh, the, our vice president for research, Dr. Karen Plout, um, to talk about her work in women and cardiovascular disease, because she's been a leader in that field, uh, as well as her own career path and the, the challenges she sees as well as her work-life balance. So November 16th. So the Women's Global Health Institute um, has uh, reaches regularly over 3,000 um, people, uh, faculty, students, staff, alumni, all kinds of people uh, across a broad spectrum because many of our events are hybrid or virtual. Um, academia, government like NIH or USDA. Uh, we have industry participants um, and alumni. Uh, our, External advisory board called us the conscience of women's health, which I love that moniker because what we do is try to bring people into the, the world of women's health research. Um, so to me personally, and I think I'm supposed to be bringing in personal things here, it is such an inspiration, um, not only to work with the team I work with, but also to watch people become engaged and in the, this field of women's health research and really have an impact on women's health through the things we fund and the events that we um, sponsor. So I think I'm supposed to stop here and say, if anybody has a question, it's not moving for me. I'd be happy to answer any questions about the Women's Global Health Institute at this point. Thanks. Thank you, Dorothy. So Joanne Troutner asked, does the Institute work with the Purdue Library's archives to capture some of the excellent work for posterity? We have not. Um, there is something that I would, uh, there's actually a book I'd really like to get published on the senior uh, excellent women at Purdue, leaders at Purdue, but uh, we have not done that. It would be an interesting thing to consider. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I believe Mary asked also another question. Okay, do you work with any major hospital systems with regards to your research? Or is all research completed at the university? Um, my personal research is all at the university. I'm a basic scientist. But um, Purdue researchers do engage uh, with some of the local um, uh, uh, hospitals. Um, and Marie, I don't know if you want to talk about the Kay's work on engaging um, uh, m m some of the local community in research as well. Would I'll let you, you do it because she did come to your symposium back in September. Uh oh, is it was it early September, right? Yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, we do also interact with the IU Medical Center and the IU Cancer Center pretty regularly in my field of cancer, um, as well as other things that we do. But um, it's been a little harder to engage with the community. Um, and, uh, uh, but it's a really good thing to be able to do. We, we are working on trying to do that better. Got it. Did you want to mention about Kay attending? Me? Oh, why don't you do it? <laughs> why don't you do it, Marie? <laughs> okay, that's fine. So the first lady of Purdue, um, Kay, Kai Wee, is going to be launching the, an affinity network for anything medical in the medical field or vet med related. So if you're interested, that email will be going out on the 12th. Anyone that's interested in volunteering or just knowing more, a little bit more, she will be giving a virtual, um, be part of a virtual meeting on November the 1st. So if you wanna know more, just contact me. I'm happy to share more information. So she is doing this obviously just to get 
she's she's a she's a wonderful person and she doesn't never wants to leave anyone out so she, she tries to include as many colleges departments your center dorothy um into the sloop and trying to get everybody talking about anything and everything in the medical and the vet world and so and as we mentioned she did attend your symposium back in september and draw and drew some um drew some she was fabulous she she gave a, a a remark at the beginning for us but she also brought in a lot of the local uh breast imaging group um the leaders uh, uh in lafayette and west lafayette um to meet and they got to meet with the uh, christiana cool so it was really great wonderful thank you so celeste did have a question are you aware of any research being done for diffuse oh my goodness idiopathic pulmonary neuroendocrine cell hyperplasia. Did I say that in one breath? GIP. Okay, there you go. I am not. I don't know of any research on campus that's doing that, unfortunately. There you go, Celeste, maybe a potential um, <laughs> research um, idea for one of these grants. Yeah, send, it, send the idea to me and let's see if we can find somebody who might be interested. Awesome. Sandy is asking, I see one of your research areas is around obesity and metabolism. What are some recent breakthroughs in this area? Thank you, Sandy, for that question. I'm uh, actually going to be, uh, I have a second presentation on my own research in breast cancer. So there's upcoming a little bit about obesity and cancer. So could we wait for that question? And if I haven't answered it? Sure. No problem. And I think that's it for the questions for now. So yes, let's go okay. ahead. Okay. Hey, thank you, Dorothy. Great. Oh, wait, 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 someone else. One more, one more from Mary. <laughs> Are you yeah. working to identify markers of cancer? Oh, I don't mean, maybe this is for the next one. Markers of cancer as exact sciences had done for colon cancer. Maybe that's for your upcoming. Day. It is the toughest thing we have to face is markers of, of cancer. And um, it's such an important thing because uh, you know, we can't do prevention research unless we have markers of cancer, for example. And, um, there are very few markers available and people have been working on this forever. Uh, and I think it's so complex that we have not, we usually look at single things and we need to look at it as a much more systems, you know, maybe there are 20 things you can find in the blood that are a predictor as opposed to, it's not going to be one thing. Um, and, and I think the technology and our ability to do that kind of analysis is just starting to catch up. Um, really important question uh, that we need to face. Um, so yeah, Very good. we don't, we haven't gotten it yet. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. You can go ahead and go to your next um, presentation. Okay. Thank you. So as I said, I was asked to do another presentation about breast cancer, uh, as well as a little bit about my own work um, on inhibition of breast cancer metastasis. Um, so, um, I know I'm speaking to the choir here that it is an incredibly important public health, uh, uh, uh problem that we are facing with cancer, um, and as particularly breast cancer, it is the number one diagnosed, uh, cancer for women in the U S uh, with almost 300,000 women being diagnosed new every year. Um, so it's a huge problem. Um, and the startling thing to me when I learned this was one in eight women, were, um, the probability uh, is one in eight women will develop breast cancer over their lifetime. And it's a huge risk um, for uh, women. And when you talk about cancer deaths, it is the second leading cause of cancer deaths behind lung uh, for women in the U.S. as well. And so... Um, uh, in the United States, in terms of overall cancer, $209 billion was estimated to be spent on medical costs for cancer in 2020, 209 billion. And even more striking, cancer deaths globally is almost 10 million people per year. A huge uh, burden uh, globally in terms of cancer deaths. But breast cancer is a really good example of um, uh, important of the importance of prevention. Uh, so here's a chart which says shows us that if a cancer, if a breast cancer, is uh, diagnosed first when it is still localized in the primary tumor, 
the five-year survival rate is really high at 99%. However, if, it, if it's first diagnosed when it has already moved away from the primary site into a, a distant metastasis or other site, the five-year survival rate drops dramatically to 27%. And the places of metastasis are common places for breast cancer, are brain, lung, liver, and bone. So a huge difference here. Um, and in fact, this metastasis accounts for 90% of all cancer-related death. Our, our biggest problem is the metastasis. Um, and approximately 700,000 women die e each year worldwide from breast cancer. Such a, a, a devastating disease um, from beginning to end, actually. So I wanted to talk a little bit of science about this process of metastasis um, and how cancer cells have to go through all these different steps and adapt to all these different things in order to leave a, a primary, the, the original tumor, and get all the way to a secondary site and grow. Um, very few cells make it. It's very hard to do multiple steps. And so this is an image of a primary tumor where cells start growing out of control. Then those cells have to change the way they behave, chew through a matrix, end up in the blood. Um, and normal cells can't survive any of that. They are, they, they'll die as soon as they start overgrowing like this. Um, so these cancer cells have to adapt to all these different environments. Then they have to get to some place where they escape the blood system and they plant themselves in a niche, um, uh, in a site that is conducive for their survival. So it, it, they like it, it's a happy place for these cells. Um, and uh, then they can either sit there and do nothing. Some of them will never do anything. Some of them will turn around right away and start to regrow and become a secondary tumor or a metastasis in a secondary site. And some of them can sit here quiet, not doing anything for decades. And then something will prompt them to turn around and start growing again. Um, so these dormant cells are really a lot of our problem with metastasis. And in order for these cancer cells to survive all these different steps, they have to do all these things to metabolically adapt. Uh, many things happen. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out here is that this escaping from the primary tumor site can be a very early event. Um, in some cases, it can happen before the primary tumor is even diagnosed. So the idea of um, uh, prevention of metastasis becomes really important, not only early diagnosis, very early diagnosis, um, way earlier than what we currently do, um, but also being able to prevent metastasis with something that is a you know, okay, I'm talking about nutrients and vitamin D that we'll get to in a few minutes, um, but that that is is not um, harmful to uh, uh, no side effects. That's already approved. That's easy to uh, incorporate. Becomes really important. I know that this has come up, so I wanted to bring this uh, data up. This task force has recently come out in terms of breast cancer screening and is now recommending starting breast cancer screening at the age of 40, uh, instead of what it was previously at the age of 50. So now we hope that everybody catches up to this, all the um, clinics and insurance companies, et cetera, catch up to this idea that uh, it's being recommended for women of the age of 40. Um, they changed it from 50, 40 to 50 about a decade ago. So we're really happy that this has been changed back to the age of 40. And I learned something very interesting from our recent talk with uh, Christiana Kuhl, uh, from Christiana Kuhl. Um, and she talked about how women who have very dense breasts are um, at a much higher risk for breast cancer. Um, but mammograms uh, are have a very, you can't see um, the tumors on a mammogram in women who have very dense breasts. It's very hard to see. Um, but she, Dr. Cool works with the MRI and has shown that it's really easy to identify those tumors in women with dense breasts with an MRI as opposed to a mammogram. And the mammogram is a standard uh, test for assessing breast cancer. So 
we have to consider whether we can encourage more MRIs in the appropriate places for women with dense breasts. So obesity. Um, yes, obesity is very associated with, or is associated with an increased risk of a variety of different cancers. Um, and in particular, uh, in uh, postmenopausal women, there's an increased uh, risk for death of breast cancer uh, in postmenopausal women. And interestingly, the opposite is true for premenopausal women. There's a re reduced risk of breast cancer in um, obese young women. However, if that woman has a cancer, a breast cancer, uh, she tends to um, develop a more aggressive cancer. So a metastatic cancer, for example, but still uh, a, a huge issue. Um, so the idea of obesity and metastasis has not been studied much at all. It's only obesity in the primary cancer. And so we are really interested in how obesity impacts metastasis specifically. And our recent research has shown, whoops, excuse me, that uh, we, we studied it in a, an animal model and our team showed that in an obese animal model, um, that it increases breast to lung metastasis. And there's been a recent study by one of my other research team members that shows that there, this also may occur in uh, um, humans, in women as well. There's an increased risk of metastasis and it increases the sites that the breast cancer cells go to when it does metastasize. So I'm gonna shift gears and talk about vitamin D. Um, so uh, vitamin D in breast cancer has been studied for decades, literally. Um, I've been involved in breast cancer and vitamin D for a long time. And overwhelmingly, the literature suggests that vitamin D inhibits breast cancer in population studies, in animal models, and in, and in cell culture. But interestingly, if you go to human trials, the results are not so um, optimistic. They're very mixed. And in fact, the last big trial by Manson, um, very large clinical trials showed that vitamin D supplementation did not reduce breast cancer risk, primary breast cancer risk. But if you exclude the women who got cancer in the first year or two of the intervention, who may already have it, um, the results show that, that vitamin D supplementation reduced metastasis in normal white women. So maybe we've been studying the wrong thing all these decades. Maybe we should have been studying only metastasis instead of just the primary tumors. And maybe we would understand this better. Um, so we're that, oops, sorry. This is a part of what we're really interested in is focusing our work now on vitamin D and how it may regulate metastasis. So we did a, an animal study, and as far as I know, it's the beginning of the work on vitamin D and metastasis. I haven't seen much else on this. Uh, in an animal model, and we took breast cancer cells, and we gave those animals a low or sufficient or a high dietary intake of vitamin D, so diet, what we would hope we could recommend. And in fact, um, the a high level of vitamin D intake decreased lung metastasis. So this is a big focus in our lab is to try to understand how vitamin D could reduce uh, metastasis, looking at all the mechanisms that might be involved with the ideas, maybe we're not taking enough vitamin D right now, um, or, uh, you know, if we could target it better to the people who it might be, have more, be more effective at, uh, with. Um, so we're really interested in how this works. Um, so um, one of the interesting things about cancer, um, and it's true of all cancers, is that they utilize certain kinds of um, uh, compounds uh, for energy differently than normal cells. So um, for example, cancer, many cancer cells take up a huge amount of glucose, far more than a normal cell, and they utilize it differently once they get it. Um, and this effect has been known since the 1920s. Dr. Warburg identified it, and it's called the Warburg effect. But in the last decade, this has become of much greater interest uh, of how this acts. And in fact, uh, chemo um, therapeutics, uh, there are some ther ther therapeutics to in inhibit this uptake of glucose into the cell as a, a, a cancer therapy. 
Um, we've also learned um, that uh, in addition to glucose, there's an amino acid called glutamine, which is again, taken up at a much higher rate in cancer cells and utilized for energy supplies. And they synthesize fats, uh, uh, lipids at a much greater rate. And that's even utilized in a different way in the cells to support the cancer cell growth. So they can shift to all these different um, sub uh, energy uh, uses or um, utilization when they go to these different environments during metastasis. So they're able to use these systems to adapt to many of the steps in metastasis. So when it comes to vitamin D, this is what we're really interested in, how vitamin D regulates these systems. And in fact, um, what we have shown in our lab um, is that vitamin D can decrease the utilization of glutamine specific to cancer cells, can decrease the ability of the cells to utilize glutamine, and actually reduces the ability of the cells to uh, synthesize these fats or lipids in the cells. Um, so essentially what it does, it in these cell lines, it starves the metastatic cell um, cancer cells. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we work in cells. Um, we need to know if this will work um, in animal models. Is this how vitamin D inhibited breast cancer metastasis? And if it works in an animal, who knows if it'll work in a human? We hope that this is indicative that it will work in a human, but we really don't know for sure yet. So uh, our hope is that ultimately this work can be taken into a human model um, uh, and maybe we do need, I mean, our, our recommendations in vitamin D right now are based on bone health. We have no idea how much vitamin D intake uh, we might need to prevent metastasis. Maybe it's a hundred units more, or um, maybe it's a substantially more. Uh, we're a long way from toxicity in vitamin D in our recommended intake. So maybe we can figure that out someday. That's our hope. So I think that's the end of that. Can I answer any questions? Did I answer your question on obesity? <laughs> I bring them. I think so. There are a lot of questions, Dorothy, and I, I'm going to mispronounce some of these words that some of these one people put. So here we go. Let's start with the first one. Uh oh. <laughs> Okay, who was the first one? I think it was, sorry, I'm gonna have to go back. Okay, here we go. Can I know more about your collaboration with women, the women's group in India? That's Maida Sharma that was asking about that. Did, would she just connect with the center there? I think the website might help Are they on that QR code, Dorothy. Yeah, so the website uh, QR code is here in the corner on the slide and um, that uh, there should be um, a, a little bit of a description of that project on there. If you want more information, be sure to contact me or Luann Bermel and we'll be happy to provide more information. Thank you. Thanks, Mita. Uh, next question was from Sandy. I see higher death rates among Black women. Is that due to lower healthcare support? That is a very interesting question. There's so much complicated in, in that. There were so many co-founders, con, confounders, sorry, co-founders, confounders. Um, there tends to be more obesity in uh, Black women. So it's hard to dissect that out. Um, and access to care very well may be a, a big issue. Are they diagnosed later? Uh, for example, we don't know that answer. We have not been able to dissect that out. There's a researcher in our department now who's studying um, colon cancer, not breast cancer, but same issue in many of our cancers, including colon cancer. And um, she's studying whether the diets in many of the um, uh, communities, uh, uh, African-American strong communities, um, have diets that may impact the microbiome that uh, increases colon cancer. So is it a dietary um, factor, but it's what they have available in that community that may promote colon cancer. Really interesting work. Um, she's a dietitian as well as a microbiome expert and a, now a colon cancer expert to, that has built it all together. It's really cool. Okay, thank you. I wish I knew. 
Yeah. Which we knew. It's a very you know, I, vitamin D, uh, the darker your skin, the less vitamin D you can synthesize. So we always say, well, maybe. And and they do have a lower um, level of vitamin D status. Uh, you know, I'm vitamin D biased. <laughs> I'm doubtful that's the answer. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. Mary's asking, are, are 3D mammograms better? I doubt my health insurance would cover an MRI, although I've never tried. <laughs> That's what Mary asked. I I think it is probably doubtful. And I think they are, uh, you know, I'm not an expert on imaging. They, I believe they are more, uh, are better. And it's one of the things um, that somehow or other we need to make a change in the system so the best imaging technology is covered. Um, you know, somebody asked Christiana that question. Um, what do we do next to try to en encourage um, the the appropriate uh, diagnostic? You know, if if you don't have dense, dense breasts, you probably don't need an MRI. Um, and her her answer was, "Well, I came here, and we all should be trying to talk about this." And um, my goal is to spread the news in order to try to encourage the the incorporation of this more into our medical system. Right, thank you. Someone had asked me directly if what, could you define dense breasts? They haven't heard that term. They're more, um, less fat, more uh, fibrous uh, okay. would be the dense breasts. And you can clearly see it on a mammogram. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Thank you. What about 3D mammograms for ID, um, cancer and dense breast tissue? For what? For I. For ID cancer in dense and dense breast tissue, that was from Lisa. ID ID like ID can I'm not sure I understand the question. I can only tell you what Christiana told me in our her presentation. Okay, mm -hmm. and that I don't know if I understand the question entirely, but um, uh, MRIs is definitely better for dense breasts. Okay, uh, she showed us some images that you couldn't see a thing with a mammogram. It was all dark and um the, okay. the tumor and in the same woman it was bright as all to see uh the tumor that was in the same woman okay thank you oh. the, uh, joanne's asking what are the issues with insurance in regards to getting screening getting a screening mri uh, i think many uh insurance companies aren't supporting it you're getting out of my area of expertise here but i'm pretty sure most <laughs> many insurance companies don't cover it uh particularly as a first diagnostic um sometimes they will do an mri as a second diagnostic i believe uh if they see a tumor on the first one but if you're not even seeing it on the first one uh, i'm not sure who is supporting an mri on a second on, on a first pass mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Are other countries, do you know if other countries are using MRI as a, as a first step? They are in Germany. They are in Germany. Okay. Absolutely. They have uh, policies that are uh, ahead of us, I would say. If you are diagnosed with a tumor, you have to go in for a secondary analysis within 10 days. Absolutely required that you have to go back in 10 days. Okay. We do not have that policy and we're so backed up in the medical system. Um, I recently had a, uh, um, uh, something show up on an MRI. They, they set me up for an appointment three months later. Um, and wow. so, uh, the, the delay is, um, really, uh, a problem here. Yeah. Three months and 10 days. That's a big difference. Maida, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly, but if you'd like to just turn on your microphone and ask your question, cause I'm not sure I understand what you meant by the two-step classification question. So we'll come back to her and for that one. Libby's asking, does the study also look at D and D3? I'm assuming she's talking about the vitamin. Libby, is that right? Say that again. D does the study also look at D and D3? Um, uh, many of the studies do look at D3, but the supplements are generally D2 still. Okay. Um, and Although there is a small difference in vitamin D metabolism with D3 and D2, it is not a huge difference. And, you know, if, if you can take vitamin D2, take it. <laughs> uh, it's not a huge difference okay. in the metabolism. Thank you. 
Oh, Mary's saying it seems very, it seems like every year my doctor puts me on prescription vitamin D after my physical for a bit. I'm blessed to live in the North where we spend six months of the year with a gray overcast sky. Well put, Mary. It is really interesting. Um, I did a study in young women's bone mass and their bone mass, it, this is college age women, was cyclical over the year. So right at the end of the winter, their bone mass went down. And of the summer, their bone mass started going up. In huh. young women, it was, you know, and the only explanation really is vitamin D. I mean. So in the north, where we live in those winter, you can't make vitamin D in the skin at all. Um, uh, even if you're out there totally exposed in the sun, the sun isn't, uh, doesn't have the right UV exposures. Thank you. That must have been interesting with those college college age students. You said, "Wow, okay, this one I'm going to kill the world." I just don't know how to say it, so forgive me. For vitamin D supplement supplementation, do you have a preference between Ergo Calciferol and Oh my goodness, Co Does someone want to Cold say Cold Calciferol? Thank Cold you, Calciferol. Yes, that's right. <laughs> you know, uh, um, Cold Calciferol is supposed to be better. Um, it is metabolized uh, more efficiently, um, but there is not that much difference. So I don't have a strong preference either way, especially because I believe the cholecalciferol is more expensive than the ergocalciferol. Mm -hmm. So I, um, you know, however you can get it, it okay. uh, it's important to get it. Sherry is asking low dose versus high dose. Any thoughts there? Um, I'm not sure exactly what the question specifically is. With um, regard to the different types of vitamin D supplementation, but um, I That's a, don't know exactly how to answer okay. that. Um, you know, if you have a vitamin D deficiency, they usually give you a couple of high doses or a higher dose for a while to um, uh, recover and then go back down to a normal dose. Okay, got it. Um, I'm just trying to skim through. I once got an ultrasound, but MRI brought brought up. Okay. Ultrasound, not as good as MRI. True. Okay. Thank you, Dorothy. Um, I think we've covered most of the questions. Does Maida want to get on? Do you want to ask your question, Maida, on the mic? Um, just turn on your microphone about the two steps. Are you are you there? I can't tell if you're there. I am not an imaging uh, expert. So. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Uh, that was not a question. That was just... Uh, Remark. Uh, I think uh, when Dorothy was saying about uh, uh, their vitamin D is not very uh, clear how it is working for cancer cancer patients and how it is working for non-cancer patients. So uh, that was the only thing that I was asking. That uh, is that uh, is uh, is that relationship more like a two-way uh, two-step classification first. We have to classify that these patients are uh, these samples are from non-cancerous uh, 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 patients, and these are from uh, cancerous patients, and then we can uh, do that uh, relationship uh, starting from uh, the cancerous uh, samples. Um, that's interesting. There's uh, um, there's a lot around that comment, but. Um, uh... So some of the problems with some of the studies that have been done, um, and this isn't exactly what you're saying, but is, you know, do they start vitamin D deficient or they, do they have plenty of vitamin D to, to start with? And we certainly can't do those studies without, um, everybody's exposed to the sun. You know, uh, it doesn't matter where you are, you're going to be exposed to the sun. So, and you can't really control that. I tried in a clinical study once I gave them little, little um, uh, packets of uh, sunscreen, they never got used, you know, <laughs> so really hard. I had these cute little packets, never got used. Um, so it's really hard to do those studies, but um, I, I don't know, um, you know, the idea of whether they have cancer or not is a really important one. Um, folic acid is a classic example of that, uh, um, where the data, uh, as well as vitamin A, actually, there was a huge trial of vitamin A when we thought it prevented lung cancer um, in the late 1990s, I believe. Um, and there were two of them, one in Europe and one in the US. And it turned out that they had to stop the study because they used people who might have 
uh, lung cancer. So people who've been exposed to asbestos or were smokers or something like that. And once you have cancer, vitamin A seems to promote it faster. So they, they but if you don't have lung cancer, it seems to prevent it. So really um, critical questions. I mean, how do you give a public health recommendation then yeah. of increasing that folate? folic acid is the same, you know, we've supplemented folic acid into our grains now, and it has done a fabulous job of preventing um, neural tube defects, because, you know, women would be pregnant, and they wouldn't even know it. So that has really increased the folic acid uh, status. But if you have colon cancer, it promotes colon cancer. So, you know, it's a really, or seems to, uh, so it's a really mixed message and very hard to give public health recommendations in that regard. I don't think that answered your question at all, but it was a, <laughs> it was a big question. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. It was a big question. I've got one more question from the audience. It's from Stephanie and she's asking, or she's first, she mentioned, we've seen progress over the last few decades for greater representation of women in clinical trials and research in women's health. What do you see as the areas that have not have the, the areas that have yet to see progress? In women's health research? Yes, in women's health. Mm -hmm. You know, NIH, the National Institute of, Requ um, of Health, requires women representation in all of their studies or a, a very good scientific justification of why not. Mm -hmm. um, so if, and much of our research is funded by them and other uh, um, um, places that fund research has stepped up to this, the plate in that regard as well. Um, I can't think of a place where it's not, um, in terms of the actual research, where women are not uh, uh, getting represented at this point because of that rule. Um, you know, it, I, I review NIH grants and I'm reviewing them now, and it's one of the things I always look at is, are they doing a job of uh, including women in the research or um, justifying why not? And if if a, a woman gets that disease, it's very hard to justify. It is not accepted. Um, breast cancer, I can kind of get away with because there's so little breast cancer in men, but for breast cancer, it's acceptable. And what what areas um, have yet to see progress? Do you know of any particular area in, the, in women's health? In women's health? Mm -hmm. um, in progress in women's health. Uh, I would say we've made a great deal of progress. Obviously, I'm breast cancer focused. Okay. And there's been a tremendous amount of breast cancer research. Um, we do need to better dissect um, the impact of, um, of, of uh, exposures mm. um, to uh, what happens in men versus women. Because much of that is either in men only, the exposure research, or they just include everybody. And there are differential responses to different kinds of exposures. And that I think is an area, they include women, but they don't tell us that women respond differently than men. And so um, that is a big issue in women's health research is to understand, um, even if women are included, that they respond differently. Cardiovascular disease is, a, is one of the examples of uh, women have a very different cardiovascular disease than men. And Paula Johnson, our upcoming speaker, is one of the leaders in that area of differences in, uh, of, uh, in cardiovascular disease. Thank you, Dorothy. Okay. Can you believe that we're at six minutes until the hour? So, um, to end this, it's tradition. Every, ladies, get your glasses ready, but I will do a, round, a lightning round. I know Dorothy's been looking forward to this for a month now. <laughs> so, I don't want to do this. <laughs> <laughs> this is a way for us to get to know our speaker at a different level. But before I go to the lightning round of questions, just really quick, what got you into this area? In breast cancer, you mean? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually started out in cancer because... Uh, it was just a cool system, really interesting system. Okay. And then as part of my work, I actually was uh, brought in cancer survivors. I, I talked to oncologists and it, and it, I mean, uh, those first sessions, I was back in the room just weeping and it really changed my entire perspective on doing this research. It 
you know, we need to reduce this burden. And uh, it, it doesn't matter whether you're diagnosed early and you don't get breast cancer again, it affects your life forever. Mm -hmm. And so important to try to understand how we can prevent it. Um, yeah. Become and a very emotional. Researchers like you are so highly valued. We appreciate all the work that you're doing to advance women's global, I mean, women's health via the Institute and all the work that you do for this. So thank, thank you. you. Um, so at this time, if everybody wants to turn on their camera and it help Dorothy answer some of these questions, if you get stuck, <laughs> so I didn't ask you any too many, many different questions. If we could, um, maybe just uh, maybe close the slide so we can see everybody's image. Cause I oh, yeah. have a picture at the end. Sorry. It's okay. Okay. There we go. So these questions are meant to go really fast, not to overthink, you know, like maybe three seconds to just kind of whip through them. I only asked you like 20 really quick ones, but I want to see your face. Let me see if I can just read these. This really quick. Okay. Can I turn off my camera then? <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, here we go. Um, number one, my super strength is? Bringing people together. If you could speak to anyone, who would it be and why? Michelle Obama. Would you because... rather travel? Oh, go sorry. Ahead. Why? And why? Oh, go ahead with the next one. No, no, no. I'd like to hear about Michelle Obama. I just think she's insp inspirational. She's a, such a smart and intelligent woman and has done so much. So, Absolutely. <laughs> Thumbs up for that. Would you rather travel to the past or to the future? Past. Favorite season? Uh, spring. Birding or gardening? <laughs> <laughs> That's sneaky. Birding. I know. <laughs> Birding is my more favorite hobby. Dogs or cats? Oh, come on, Maria. I know. <laughs> so I have a, a rescue dog, a very sweet rescue dog, and I have four cats, but I can't rate them one or the other. I love them both. <laughs> oh, I kind of should do that. What is something you shouldn't tell us? Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> no. What is the most common question you get asked as the director of WGHI? um help me um <laughs> that you know our goal is to help people do their research so um I think you all asked some of the other questions that were often asked about women's health issues and inclusion of them and how, what do we need to do in the, to move forward okay my childhood in three words I was the youngest sibling of five okay that was more than three words <laughs> what brought, the most challenging part of my work is? Oh, that's hard. I love my work. Um, time is really the most challenging. The best part of my work? I, um, again, I love my work. I, I love working with students. I love my department. I wouldn't want to be anywhere else. Um, I love my colleagues. Um, so I'd say there's a lot. Sorry, can't tell you one. What health advice would you give to anyone at any age, any woman at any age? Health advice? Mm -hmm. Take care of yourself, uh, prevention, um, and take care of uh, those around you as well. Okay. Most amazing medical breakthrough? Ever? Ever. Maria, you, come on. I know. I know. <laughs> Just pick one out of the top 20. <laughs> Colonoscopies. <laughs> okay. What do we still need to invent? What do we still need to invent? I think you said it, uh, a marker for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. Not I invent, but identify. What makes you hopeful? Wow, that's tough. But the people around me and um, their passion and, and interest in care. What do you want to be remembered for? Helping other people, particularly women. If you had unlimited funds, where would you invest it in at Purdue? Oh, come on. The WGHI. <laughs> and Purdue is? I don't know. In, oh. What? Purdue is? Uh, a great place to work. Awesome. Thank <laughs> you. That was too tough, wasn't it? <laughs> okay, I, I made it easy for you. Okay. So thank you again, Dorothy. We really appreciate you being here this evening.